Hello, and welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance with your host, Nick Urban. Today, we're discussing one of my personal favorite topics and one that has been making the rounds in the health and performance realms, and that is peptides, therapeutic peptides. And particularly, we're talking about the peptides that are orally bioavailable, meaning peptides you can take in capsule form. And joining us today is one of the world's greatest formulators who combines a bunch of different peptides to achieve specific benefits and effects throughout the body. I have a number of his products in front of me, such as the Ultimate GI Repair, and these contain a host of some of the most popular peptides, such as BPC-157 in the arginine salt form, KPV, lorazotide acetate, a bunch you've probably never even heard of. And what I like about his formulas is that he understands the necessary cofactors and resources your body needs to make the best use of these peptides. So you're not just flushing money down the toilet. So who is this mystery formulator? His name is Kyle Vanderleest, and he is the mastermind behind a company called Level Up Health. They are based out of Australia and they don't just carry peptides, but all kinds of other ingredients and supplements. In front of me, I have one called Hista Resist, which helps quell the symptoms of allergies and irritation in a natural way. I've got a KPV complex that has that with other important bioactive molecules. I've got Tudka for liver health, and as I mentioned, the GI, Ultimate GI Repair. In this episode, we break down each of the formulas and a whole lot more, such as one particular ingredient that I've used to great success on days that I plan on consuming some booze to avoid the hangover and more importantly, to reduce some of the damage it causes. And as a side effect, it even helps blunt the intoxication effect by upregulating two detoxification enzymes. Kyle, on the other hand, is a nutritionist, a naturopath, and functional health coach turned supplement formulator. He founded Level Up Health to create the products he wished he could have suggested and used when he worked in clinics and supplement stores, and for his own use during his health journey and experimentation. Level Up formulations are a fusion of multiple health modalities, using what works no matter where it comes from. Their formulations target the root cause of health issues and work on a multitude of biochemical targets in the body, providing customers like me with products that actually work as promised. If you found this kind of thing interesting, you can check out the show notes at mindbodypeak.com slash and then the number 111. And if you find this kind of thing interesting, you can pick up some of his products and use the code URBAN, which I believe will save you about 10% on your order. Level Up Health is also one of the outlier approved peptide vendors because they consistently deliver high quality products without taking shortcuts and so when you see a product listed on their site, you can be sure it's going to work as well as that product and raw ingredient can. Okay, with that out of the way, sit back, relax, and enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Kyle Vanderleest. Welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you to Australian Wi-Fi Speeds for being terrible. <laughs> yep. And you told me a minute ago that it is early in the morning over there. It is about seven in the morning. And although I usually ask this for the later in the day podcasts, what are the unusuals or non-negotiable things you've done so far today for your health, your performance, and your bioharmony? For the health, uh, performance, and bioharmony today, I have taken paraxanthine, a caffeine metabolite, which makes my brain work as well as it possibly can um, some nootropics to support acetylcholine like alpha gpc cdp choline and huperzine a is another one that i've taken as well because that's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor mm. um, uridine monophosphate and yeah that combined with the paraxanthine has supported dopamine and normally i have a very good routine in the morning uh, but i have a less than two month old baby so all, all of the uh, usual non-negotiables have kind of been thrown out of the window 
when you've got a newborn who you don't want to wake up in the morning or you don't want to use your red light therapy in the room because it might wake him up. So um, prior to his birth, I used to get up and have a red light therapy session and then a gym session within, you know, the first hour or two of waking up in the morning. And I live in beautiful Sunshine Coast in Queensland where there's usually a lovely sunrise and I would get some sun in the eyes to sort of set the circadian rhythm. So that's that was my usual, but at the moment it's kind of all over the place. So we'll uh, we'll get back to that when the baby's sleep schedule normalizes. Nothing like having a newborn to test what really are those non-negotiables. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess they're not non-negotiables if the baby has <laughs> made it negotiable. So, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, um, it's interesting too, when you have a baby, you very heavily lean on nootropics to get you through a day where you haven't slept well and happily to happy to report things like creatine and tyrosine. And I think there's a um, precursor to creatine I've been trying called GAA. That's mm-hmm. been fantastic for brain health as well. So I've really been leaning on those heavily and they've been looking after me, which has been fantastic to mm. to feel. Yeah. How did you settle on those? Because I've interviewed Sean Wells and Daniel of Drink Update about paraxanthine, and I've talked a bit about nootropics, aka brain boosting supplements to simplify. But how did you settle on those specific ingredients to incorporate into your routine? Trial and error, like if you saw my supplement um, pantry, you would see over a hundred random supplement ingredients and formulations all put together. And it's honestly just the biohacker in me. If like something excites me, I'll try it before I even really look too far into it. And then once I've tried it and experienced how good it feels, I'm like, I want to know everything about this. So paraxanthine was one of those ones I did hear Sean Wells talk about. And um, uh, in Australia, we can't get the drink that you spoke about from him and uh, the other guy's company, but we can get a pre-workout formulation that Sean um, put together um, for Muscle Tech. And I tried that one out and just felt incredible and didn't have the usual crash associated with high stimulant, things like caffeine or even the dynamine metabolite that he also brought to market. Those things sort of bring you up and then sort of you come crashing down to earth a bit later. But Parazanthine didn't have that effect at all and I felt really good from it and um, yeah so far so good I've been taking that for over a month and a half now and you know there's not really been any downside to it so yeah that's why I really like that one all the other ingredients too like things like tyrosine that's pretty much a no-brainer because um, well it will help your brain because being the precursor to a lot of the uh, neurotransmitters but being an amino acid essential amino acid um, you really can't go wrong with things like that. So that's why I like those. Yeah. And there's a lot of trial and error, as you mentioned, that goes along with it. I also have the kitchen cabinet full of hundreds of different powders, pills, potions, elixirs. And I found that when I used a form of like more bioactive tyrosine, N-acetyl, what is it? N-acetyl L-tyrosine NALT, it gave me a headache. And sometimes it worked great. But most of the time, it made me feel like a robot. So I steered clear of that. And then when I've tried it in other formulations, maybe at a different dosage, much lower dosage, it actually doesn't have those effects and has a nice uplifting effect instead. So yep, a lot of trial and error associated with this stuff. There are some as well, like L-DOPA, the the direct precursor to dopamine that Short term is fantastic, but long term can cause issues like dopamine receptor down regulation. So I've experienced that one and I've had issues with that thing. And I mentioned it before, but um, Huperzine A is another one, which again, like short term, I've used it today. It's fantastic as an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, but long term has a array of side effects that you kind of find out about yourself the hard way. And even alpha GPC, one that most people use. I pushed that too high and had horrible migraine headaches. So um, biohackers, you can thank us for doing this stuff to ourselves so we can share our experiences and go through things that hopefully you, the audience, don't have to yourself. (laughs) Yeah, that's the way to do it too, to look to the safety data when possible and then also at the anecdotes because a lot of this stuff won't actually have lots of robust data for years, if not decades down the line. Yeah, unfortunately, things that are natural tend not to be researched unless they can be modified to become patentable. And that sort of is the case with peptides, which is my big um, topic of interest is peptides are these amazing things that people are getting on the bandwagon of, but really without a whole heap of robust human research, 
And um, you can look at it one way, like I'm not going to try something that doesn't have, you know, 10 years of research behind it in humans. Or you can look at it from the perspective of, well, am I actually willing to wait that 10 years to take something that can give me benefit now and has like very little um, safety concerns because they're found naturally in the body and there's no lethal dose been found for most of the peptides. I'm not going to say all of them, but most of the ones, especially the ones I've used, um, there's a very, very, very wide therapeutic margin. Things like BPC-157, they found the lethal dose of that would be the equivalent of about $80,000 worth of BPC, and that was in mouse studies. So I don't think anyone's going to find um, any toxicities with things like that. Well, we're only a few minutes in. You've already touched on two of my favorite topics, that is nootropics and peptides. So as we start to go in, down the rabbit hole, that is peptides in one of your specialties, will you give us a interesting fact or tidbit about this world, specifically peptides, because that's going to be a big portion of our conversation today? Right. So peptides are amazing. They're my, one of my favorite compounds I've ever experimented with. Um, but in Australia, where I live, they have kind of a dirty word. Um, peptides came to the forefront probably about 10, 15 years ago in Australia with professional, we call it AFL football. There was a club called Essendon, and they became very quickly, within one season, they flipped from being like a low to mid-tier team to one of the elite, one of the best teams. And they got persecuted for taking peptides. Um, at the time, no, none of the authorities or the regulatory bodies knew what their peptides were, but all of it was very obvious that the players were on them because they were all recovering really fast. They had, they looked like absolute specimens. It was a team full of biohacked athletes, and their, mu their muscles were bulging. They were like one of the top teams in a, in the in the league and the captain ended up being the best for the um the whole league it's called he won what's called the brownlow medal which is awarded to the best player for the whole league and yeah they all were on peptides or on the growth hormone secretagogues they were on um injectable colostrum or some i think it was that and um aod um the anti-obesity drug peptide they're on that one as well so oh, and tb500 and it wasn't until it was looked into after the fact that they decided to ban peptides, but they all got in trouble and basically the team and all the players who took the peptides got banned for the following season and the, cap the captain of the team who won the award for being the best player got stripped of his medal because it was unfair and not in the spirit of professional sports to have taken those things. Rather than other teams and the league learning from how successful that team was in integrating these peptide protocols with all the other teams they just cut down the one team that did it and had great success so that's an interesting tidbit about um, peptides within my country australia is most people think of them as cheating or as illicit substances and sort of categorize them in the same in the same breath as things like testosterone and um, anabolic steroids or psalms but they're really not like most peptides um, that we used in like functional medicine are found within the body. There's a few that are synthetic, but they are actually categorized as drugs if they're synthetic, whereas the ones that we use like BPC, um, TB500, um, Ipamoral, and all of these are found naturally within the body. Mm, yeah, so that is a good place to start. And one of the distinctions I want to make, you mentioned that they're naturally found within the body, but so are exogenous or not exogenous, endogenous hormones such as testosterone. So why are the peptides fair for use in sport, whereas the other anabolics aren't? Well, I guess that's a, a, a debate, isn't it? We could have, um, you, you could argue both ways too. Like I could be devil's advocate and say, yeah, well, why should someone have all of this extra BPC? And my argument would be to protect the player. Like these people who are professional athletes, especially ones where there's a real risk for head injury, deserve to have some level of protection. And the neuropeptides like, dihexa, cerebrolysin, P21, all of these things should be almost used proactively or immediately after a head injury to protect the player from concussion and traumatic brain injuries and BPC is another one. So that's a reason why you should. Why, a reason why you shouldn't is, well, it's a level playing field if nobody's on it 
And I think actually recently, as of November last year, um, BPC has been banned, WADA banned. So I'm pretty sure this debate we're having has been had at <laughs> higher levels and people have decided that even though it's found naturally within the body, taking exogenous and high levels of it is considered an unfair sporting advantage. So, yeah, I think um, the jury's still out on and, and it's up to everyone's personal ethics whether these things should be banned or not. But, you know, WADA has decided for black belts in contact sports and WADA-tested athletes that BPC is a banned substance. Yep. I've been researching two articles that I wrote, one on the best and most powerful ergogenic aids, the ones that are sometimes banned by WADA, sometimes not, and then also on the peptides that you've mentioned so far. And one big distinction I've seen between them, between peptides and some of the other agents that are banned, is that peptides are safe in super physiological dosages because the body doesn't have to, quote, accept the changes. It can reject the changes and... But because of that, they have much better safety profile and they also help protect the player versus with anabolic steroids or something along those lines. If you are careless and don't know what you're doing, the consequences can be much more severe and life-altering in a negative way if it's not done carefully under the supervision of a practitioner. Absolutely. Fantastic point. I completely forgot about the down regulation of your own hormone production and even like the associated risks of cancer if you're using, if you're, you know, using the wrong things. The other thing that's really frustrating with it too is from an injury prevention standpoint, strengthening your connective tissue, your lig ligaments and tendons and the fascia with peptides would be fantastic. But instead, what's allowed are corticosteroid injections, which have a direct catabolic effect on those connective tissue and we've seen it time and time again i think kevin durant in the nba was a fantastic example when his achilles ruptured he should have been on something to strengthen it instead they just kept injecting him with cortico um, cortisone shots and then had a horrible injury and this is potentially the livelihood of that player for the rest of their life that's you know been jeopardized by using one thing over another yeah. And there are plenty of debates about this online. So we can direct people there if they want to pursue those. Instead, we're going to focus on your background now and how you got involved with this, because I don't think you were a professional athlete that was risking getting banned from using one of these peptides. No, I wasn't a professional athlete. It would be quite fun to be one, but no. I uh, worked at a hyperbaric oxygen clinic that did actually have interactions with those players. That's why I'm so knowledgeable on the topic uh they as i said they were a team full of biohackers they did all the peptides they also did cryotherapy and hyperbaric oxygen therapy and all these fantastic things and that's my background is i studied nutrition um human nutrition and my first job after graduating was working at that clinic and the clinic was a fantastic trial by fire it was a combination of professional athletes like novak djokovic and a heap of the Australian Open tennis stars would come in and do hyperbaric oxygen to prime their body prior to their events. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it were the chronically ill people. There were a lot of cancer patients, a lot of Lyme disease patients, um, autoimmune disease patients who would come in. So it's interesting with biohacking, what works for athletes also works for chronically ill people because fundamentally you want to enhance the mitochondria and cellular health and hyperbaric is fantastic for that and pretty much every single one of the nootropics and supplements that we use sort of long term are going to help our mitochondria and make it help our efficiency and energy production things like methylene blue um that was a really good one that i used a lot when i was in the hyperbaric oxygen uh, facility but um also while i was working there i was got really interested in natu naturopathic medicine because I'd sort of learnt the nutrition and the um, the precursors, all the building blocks for um, all the uh, neurotransmitters, all of the systems in the body. But interesting to me were the botanicals and things like adaptogens, um, think all the herbal extracts, like, um, ashwagandha, all these things were really fantastic at synergizing with the, nutri with the nutrients. So while I was working at that clinic, um, yeah, I also started studying naturopathic medicine in Melbourne. And it was fantastic working there while studying because you'd learn something in natu nat naturopathy school. And then later in the day, you'd go into a clinic 
and it would be like direct directly relevant what you just learned in class to a patient who was presenting in the clinic so uh yeah working there combined with uh the clinic director who was just a wealth of knowledge and very uh hugely formative in my learning he had he had because it's been taken down but he had a website that had over 300 pages on all these different um, ingredients and substances which can help with different diseases including peptides too so he um introduced me to them at that clinic and there was i believe it was co it was called como compounding which were a branch of tailor made uh which were one of the biggest peptide companies in america they were directly over the road from where i worked and one of the one of the doctors who worked at that compounding chemist would come over and consult with the people who um, came into our hyperbaric oxygen clinic so peptides were used in that clinic and that's sort of where I got my introduction to them. And But it was always very difficult to get these peptides because it was at a compounding chemist. You needed to have a, a doctor's consultation. And for me, I just wanted to try these things. I didn't actually have a medical condition or medical need to have these. So I looked elsewhere. I looked overseas and tried to import them and found it impossible to get them through Australian customs. So... Um, I looked from within and there, if there were there was one company um, doing BPC and I reached out to them and uh, ended up taking over that company's uh, product. Um, they went away from making it themselves and just went into manufacturing and now they're my manufacturers for it and I run Level Up who sell BPC capsules and a variety of other peptides and an ever-expanding range of supplements that um, are basically products that I wish I had to use with people when I worked at the clinic and, you know, was helping people as a naturopath. Yeah. Well, you have some very interesting formulas over there at Level Up Health. And I want to dig into those because I think people who have heard peptides, and I've mentioned them previously on the show, they're usually injectables. And that might be great for some people, but others just don't want to go down that whole rabbit hole and have to go through that. So let's talk about some of the different formulas you created and why and you created them and how you came about choosing each of the different ingredients because a lot of your products have multiple ingredients that seem to like synergize together. Synergy is the word. That's exactly what I'm going for. We learn about it in naturop naturopathic school, synergy between all the different herbs working on one mechanism that overlaps with another one. So using that philosophy and applying it to um, the, the uh, peptide-based products was how I, um, how I put together these formulations. But um, I really want to quickly touch on what you said at the start was oral versus injectable peptides because that's something... I don't know if your audience had heard this before, but most peptides, almost all of them, will get degraded by stomach acid. That's sort of the point of stomach acid and pepsin in the in the um, stomach is to break down protein. When you eat a steak, you want that to work. But when you ingest a peptide, you don't want that to happen. There's certain peptides that can withstand the stomach acid, BPC being one of them. Um, a lot of the other ones that are oral have to be like enterically coated or have some sort of buffer to prevent the breakdown of the peptide. All the ones that level up cells are capable of withstanding the stomach acid. There's some fragments of thymus and beta, TB4 frag. That one can survive. Um, I would sell that in Australia, but I don't want to go to jail because that's a banned one here. <laughs> But yeah, BPC as the arginate form has about a 90% um, survival rate of passing through the stomach and preventing it from getting um, degraded by pepsin, which is a pro proteolytic enzyme made in our stomach. Let's define what peptides are just to make sure everyone's on the same page. That way, these, might, these terms will make sense to them. And then also, I notice with BPC, I see that it comes in different forms and you chose a very specific form. Why is that? Yep. So peptides are just short chains of amino acids, less than 50 amino acids long. Any bigger than that, it's a protein. Um, and peptides, there's thousands of them within the body, insulin being probably the main one that everyone knows about. Um, insul insulin is another perfect example of a, protein, a peptide that doesn't survive the stomach acid. That's why diabetics need to inject it. That's why most peptides that people use, they do need to subcutaneously inject it. Um, I've done that before in the past with a few different ones. I played around with melanotan and looked like a bronze god. 
<laughs> but also had, uh, as Ben Greenfield says, when he tried it, um, uncontrollable erections. So be careful if you're trying the Melanotan or no, the MSH derived ones. Yeah, uh, the form that of BPC I use is BPC arginate. There are three forms. There's sodium BPC, um, there's BPC acetate, and there's BPC arginate. There might be more, but there's the three that I reckon make up 99% of all the BPC on the market. Um, BPC acetate is commonly what people use and inject because it doesn't survive the stomach acid, but if you're injecting it, that's not a concern anyway. And it's also eight times cheaper. So some some brands use this orally, expecting it to work if you take it in a capsule. But at best, you're going to get about 10 to 20% absorption of that peptide. So they not trying to trash talk any other brands. But usually if the price is low, it's because they've used that form. The prices that we have for it, are they are what they are. I can't, you can't go any lower if you use quality the, the correct form of the peptide. So um, if you use something like BPC acetate, you know, you, you, you take 1,000 micrograms, you're probably only going to get 200 micrograms of active actually make it through the stomach lining versus if you take 1,000 micrograms of BPC acetate, you're likely going to get above 900 micrograms, so 90% of it go through. Yes, melanotan is a great peptide to keep your skin safe if you're exposed to a lot of UV, but it does have some side effects. I can confirm that from personal experience. And then on the BPC side, I've talked to a number of people that have reported they got no benefits or virtually zero benefits out of it. And I suspect it's because they were price shopping for the cheapest, the cheapest product possible, not knowing that the form of this peptide actually matters tremendously if you're taking it orally. Yes, it does. The other thing that people um, need to be aware of too is orally it will act on the GI tract first. Before, If you're taking BPC capsules to heal a distal injury, say like golfer's elbow or you've got some wrist tendinopathy or something like that, um, it will it has the potential to help with that condition. But if you have chronic gut inflammation or leaky gut, then 95 to almost 100% of it will probably get used locally in the GI tract before it even has the chance to act upon the distal site. You can overcome this by like mega dosing it, like taking like three times the recommended uh, amount because that sort of like super saturates the system and then it's not going to all get used in the GI tract. So it will end up in circulation uh, and then hopefully being a peptide that works almost intelligently at finding places where it needs to go, it circulates and it's not going to act upon areas where there is actually no purpose for it to act upon. If there's no need for this peptide to do anything, it just circulates until it's broken down by hydrolase enzymes. Um, but if you do have a distal side of injury, getting a super saturated dose, um, sort of like maybe a 1500 microgram dose would be what I'd suggest, especially if you've never used it before and you have underlying gut issues. Seems like in that case, it might make more sense just to use BPC via injection and maybe even combine it, stack it with TB500, TB4. Definitely. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that taking it orally would work as efficacious as someone who sells it orally, but I'm not going to lie. It, if you inject it close and proximal to the site of injury, then you are going to have better outcome than if you take it orally because you're taking out the variables of um, how well it's going to survive the stomach acid and then how much is going to get used by the gut, as we mentioned. Mm. Yeah. So walk me through your ultimate GI repair formula. I have this and I just started taking it recently. What is in it and how did you choose what to add in terms of ingredients and what are the differences, the changes users can expect to see? Yeah, all right. So that one's my pride and joy and level up to bestseller now um, because it has a combination of three GI healing peptides. First one being BPC, which I've mentioned before. Uh, the second one's KPV, which is interestingly a frag, a, it's under the same category as melanotan in an, in the fact that it's derived from MSH, melanocortinin stimulating, melanin stimulating hormone or melanocortinin can't remember exactly but msh fragment there are two others one's called p1 pt141 um there's melanotan one melanotan two and kpv they're all under the same sort of system um for increasing msh and kpv is an orally bioavailable one 
that has anti-fungal, anti-candida, and immune regulating effects. And it also is being studied quite um, comprehensively at the moment for things like um, IBD, like Crohn's and colitis. And it's one of one of the two. I can't exactly remember which one, but it's being studied quite heavily for that and having pretty promising effects. Um, and the third peptide in that formulation is called the rosatide acetate. AT1001 is the peptide code for that one. And this one has basically, unlike the other two, which are pretty um, pretty multimodal in their effects, lorazotide only really has one effect, and that's a zonulin antagonist. And for anyone in functional medicine, that's like exciting, but for the layperson, that might not mean anything. So I'll explain what lazonulin is and why we'd want to antagonize it or stop its effect. Zonulin is this little protein that gets made in in response to things like gluten or glyphosate exposure and its purpose is to increase permeability of the gut and too much of this is a bad thing like a short-term amount is good because it increases the absorption of things from our diet but if too much of this basically leaves the the, the gates open, so to speak, in our gut. And when this happens, then things like bacterial endotoxin, which is very inflammatory, can enter. Um, heavy metals, all the things that in our, in our gastrointestinal lumen, all these things that really shouldn't be entering circulation have a chance to enter circulation. And then when they do, basically our body can enter a state of chronic inflammation where it's con- constantly trying to deal with this influx of things that should not be within. And zonulin is kind of the gatekeeper. It increases, it breaks down tight junctions and the tight junctions are like the Velcro between the cells of our gastrointestinal tract. If you break the Velcro, then it, you know, you've got no integrity there and you've only got one, it's only one cell thick, our, our um, GI tract, uh, our lining of our, of our um, gut, uh, gastrointestinal tract. So That's where all the other natural um, compounds in the GI repair come in. They're sort of more supportive with the nutritionals, things like tributyrin. That is a form of butyrate, which is the fuel for that that cell layer in our um, epithelium. If you provide it the fuel fuel source, which normally things like dietary fiber will break down into butyrate and then feed it. But if you provide it directly, then you kind of take out the... um, the microbiome, you take that out of the equation and can really help nourish the um, epithelium. Yeah, one thing I was curious about is with the, what was it, the lorazotide loraz, acetate, so that reduces levels of zonulin. I always thought that you just wanted to crush zonulin and keep it as low as possible, not considering the fact that if you completely reduce it, then you're going to be inhibiting your ability to absorb nutrients. So some level is a good thing, but I have a feeling that most of us have too high levels of zonulin through lifestyle and diet rather than the opposite. Yeah, exactly. It's a very weirdly skewed bell-shaped curve. Like only a very little amount is kind of what we need um, versus the amount we actually have, which you can test for this. You can do fecal zonulin tests to see where your levels are at. You can do serum zonulin tests because... Zonulin doesn't just stop at the gastrointestinal tract in the um, in the uh, tight junctions. When it enters circulation, it kind of has effects on any of these um, barriers we have, including the blood-brain barrier. There's a lot of research that zonulin basically reduces the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And when that happens, then that's when you th- things like brain fog can occur. And a lot of, you do not want things like uh, lipopolysaccharide entering your brain, I can tell you from first-hand experience with mold that that does not lead to good effects at all. So um, blood-brain barrier integrity is really critical too for preventing any of these toxins that have been absorbed um, either from the diet, like if you've got levels, high levels of heavy metals, for example. You do not want a broken down blood-brain barrier because then, then they have the potential to accumulate in fatty organs, the brain being one of them. And so inhibiting zonulin will basically allow those tight junctions to reform. Um, if you, it basically binds, lorazotide binds to the same site that zonulin would. So by inhibiting it and jumping in, jumping in the seat, so to speak, that zonulin was going to, you don't have any effect. And then things like the BPC can work to increase epithelial growth factor, um, VEGF, all these other factors, which are very important for healing. 
And you basically, I, I analogously describe um, lorazotide as if your gut is wounded, lorazotide are kind of like the stitches, kind of like the staples on the wound, whereas the BPC is the thing that sort of heals it and the KPV and then the other naturals like quercetin. Quercetin has a sealing effect on the gut. Zinc carnosine, the carnosine portion of the zinc is very um, anti, is a very strong anti-inflammatory, and the zinc is really important for the the gut lining as well as well as the skin, which is kind of our external lining. So all of the ingredients that I included in that formulation are to heal leaky gut essentially, and that's why it's called the GI repair. When I was looking through the ingredients list, I immediately noticed that you used different forms, the more expensive forms of zinc. And you didn't just use zinc. I was a little worried first when I saw zinc, but you actually balanced it out with copper too. Yeah, yeah. The zinc to copy, copper ratios is something that initially when I formulated it, I didn't have the copper, but I also didn't anticipate people with IBD, chronic um, infl- autoimmune disease would be taking it constantly um i kind of formulated it for people only really with leaky gut so if you were to take such a high dose of zinc for a month or two you're not going to throw out your ratios in that shorter period of time but i had people taking it for people have been taking it for almost two years like on and off and that higher level of zinc would has the potential to throw out your ratios luckily i think most people don't tend to be skewed in the direction of high zinc to low copper i think it's usually the opposite so um is a lower level for risk for the lay public because think zinc has kind of been depleted out of the um, the soil uh, a fair bit with farming practices. And um, uh, copper tends to be one that people kind of are low in as well. I think both of them are things that people can definitely help. But the ratio of zinc to copper in that is pretty well balanced now that if you were to take it long term, you really shouldn't be too much of a problem. Yeah. And I would agree with you, except until recently, I think that the late person didn't supplement zinc. But due to immunity issues over the last couple of years, a lot of people have been just taking an isolated form of zinc without any copper. And so there's a lot of side effects that are becoming more popular, such as hair issues, because of the imbalance ratio of zinc to copper. And there's a Dr. Morley Robbins, who talks a lot about the importance of that ratio. And seems like we're going the wrong direction. So even if people aren't taking as high doses and as often with the Ultimate GI Repair, it's nice to have that safety buffer in there. Yeah, yeah. Morley Robbins' work is definitely something that influenced my decision to put the copper in there. Uh And uh, yeah, interesting. (laughs) I didn't actually consider how much zinc people are probably taking prophylactically to prevent them from getting what we uh, endearingly call the spicy cough in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And then I also saw that you added sodium bicarb into that. Why was that? Yeah, so I described some of the ways that peptides get broken down um, in the stomach. And pepsin is the proteolytic enzyme that breaks down protein. It begins as pepsinogen, which is the inactive form of this enzyme. And then in the presence of low acidity, so whenever you normally consume um, consume protein, um, the acidity drops and hydrochloric acids produced um bicarbonate is a acidity buffer so by putting it in the capsule it sort of like creates a protective um acidity buffer layer around the peptide to prevent the pepsin to pep um, the pepsinogen to pepsin conversion and therefore protecting the peptide making it even though the bpc form is pretty um already as it is pretty um bioavailable and protected against acid by adding that buffer to it, it kind of protects the other two, which normally need to be enterically coated and you need to be pretty careful with how you prepare them. But by just using the bicarbonate, the capsule, uh, um, inside of the capsule, it kind of just protects it and prevents that enzyme from breaking the other two and the BPC down. Mm, okay, yeah. And I, I know that with coffee, people who have sensitive stomachs a lot of times like to add some baking soda to their coffee to help buffer the acidity. So... If you're going to be consuming something that's acidic or a meal that might ha- might be high in acids, would you want to consume this with or without it? That's a good point. I've never considered that or been asked that. Um, I guess it's more to do with the protein than it is the acidity of the food because even coffee comparative to your stomach acid at a base is going to be less acidic than your hydrochloric acid in your stomach. It's more the protein consumption that I advise people to stay away from. So if you're taking it, 
the real bittersweet part about the formulation is the high dose zinc can cause nausea for people. So I say, oh, you just take it with food, but with the nuance of don't make make sure that food's not a big hunk of steak or a big piece of protein, because then the protein's going to increase the amount of pepsin in there and reduce the efficacy a little bit. Um, but if people do get the nausea, which can happen and has happened quite a bit from um, the high dose of zinc, you either half the dose or take it with some fats or some carbohydrates. And then another one of yours that I saw that was fascinated by was the Hista Reset or Hista Resist. That's what it is. Yeah, Hista Resista. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Hista Resist. That's basically a product that I created when I was living in chronic mold, um, as is the new one that I have released called Complete Liver Complex. These products were made from necessity, really. Um, histamine issues usually have a root cause, which Hista Resist admittedly doesn't address unless that issue is you know you genetically don't make m- much of the dao enzyme kyle let's rewind then a bit because i think this will be important to understand about your backstory about you said that you had mold several times now so let's get into that and then we can go back to these products to show how they supported you throughout yeah sure um unfortunately i lived in mold i moved house and the house i moved into had really really bad water damage um just for people's reference, you if you check the moisture content of the walls, which you can use, uh, which you can do with a, a tool that's pretty inexpensive, you should find it below 10%. Um, and then, you know, the cellulose, which is essentially what most uh, walls are made out of, is fuel for mold. Um, you need the two combinations of fuel, um, so the food and then moisture. And the walls we had were 30% moisture content which is basically just perfect environment combined with the humidity of the environment that i lived in the whole house was just riddled with mold and within two months of living there my energy went from nine out of ten ten out of ten most days down to about a three and even a two and then what happens to the body is chronic fatigue that throws out your um hormones as well men sort of lose their libido your brain the brain fog was atrocious like i like doing podcasts and speaking but i just had no confidence to do it my verbal fluency was not non-existent i couldn't complete sentences and then i was also left with this state of dissociation where i was basically in survival mode i wasn't really thinking ahead it was just about the here and now and that was very taxing mentally and that you can test where your levels of mold are at um and i tested mine and i was like I think 20 times over the upper end of the reference range for mycotoxins. You can do what's called a mycotox test or you can do an organic acids test. And I did both of those and found that basically my levels were just horrendous in aflatoxin. There's ocrotoxin and xenobione and all these other things. And I'd suggest people don't learn about mold from me, learn from Dr. Evan Brand. Um, He's the one who basically saved my butt when I was living in this situation hardlining every like the whenever i had the mental function to actually retain information i'd just listen to him or i'd go on a walk and get out of the house by the water and listen to his podcasts and really help me get out of that and mold essentially creates a state of chronic histamine intolerance so all the foods i used to love like my slow cooked bone broth bone broths and slow cooked meats were causing horrible reactions in my body and bloating and um leaky gut too like mold is probably one of the worst things for your gut lining. Um, when you look at things like glyphosate and gluten, they kind of don't even hold a candle to what mold toxin can do to your gut. If they punch holes in your gut lining, then um, uh, mold toxins kind of like rip, like a Stanley knife ripping like <laughs> your gut lining. So most people who live in mold will have bloating and GI upset, and it's almost incurable as well while you're still in there. Um, you kind of have to remediate if you can or change your environment, unfortunately. I wish I had really simple solutions like, oh, just take this or just do that. But mold is really um, a tricky one to get on top of. And it was only moving and actually disposing of most of our poorest possessions that allowed us to finally get our health back after that. Pretty intense. But from that, you know, every every dark moment has a silver lining to it so like i learned a hell of a lot living in that situation and that's sort of where history is this came in look because essentially all of the products essentially i mean not wanting to take eight products at once (laughs) 
<laughs> um, and hysteresist was I was taking Seeking Health's DAO by itself. I was taking EMIQ by itself and um, all the all the mast cell stabilizers and just put them all in the one product that really helped me as sort of like a life jacket while I was still in the situation I was. And a lot of people genetically have issues with histamine. They don't either create much of the DAO enzyme, which is the main enzyme in our body, which breaks down histamine and clears it out of our, our body. They also might not make much of histamine and methyltransferase. So all of the th there's basically three pathways for clearing histamine and getting it out of your body and hysteresist essentially just supports all of those pathways and was a life jacket as i said and i will also note um i had basically unlimited supply of gi repair being my product while i was in the mold and unfortunately it's a good product but it didn't fix my gut issues and while i was still in there so that's a nuance that people need to know and a lot of the time when people say they've tried the product and it didn't notice anything and they're still got problems or, oh, it worked and now I'm, I'm back to where I was. You know, you, you obviously assess their lifestyle and diet, but most of the time people who come to peptides are already pretty optimized because it's sort of like an end thing. You don't really get into peptides before you get into diet. Um, but usually like nine times out of 10, people have some level of mold in their environment, which is um, rendering the product all less effective or just completely non-effective, which sucks, but it's a reality. Um, and luckily like hysteresis did save my butt while I was in there and managed to still function. Thank you. Thanks to that one and GI repair. But, um, yeah, mold is definitely something I'd encourage people to look into if they're just not getting anywhere with their health. Um, Dave Asprey is one that I think most of your audience would know. He, mold is, was essentially the form, the formation of bulletproof, like him having horrible brain fog and basically neurodegeneration at a young age because of all the mycotoxin he was exposed to is what allowed him to basically drove him to form bulletproof. And I don't think he's with them anymore, but um, yeah, that whole business and he's basically his whole life stemmed from dealing with chronic mold. So it's a big one. Yeah. Mold is one of those things that it seems like it, there's so many different symptoms it presents as, and it's so difficult to remediate and go on with your life that I just like hope that that's not something people are dealing with because of like how disruptive it is. But and I, I, I'm a little bit paranoid about running one of these panels and being like, oh yeah, actually I have mold and I need to address this too. So I'm like, I haven't done them and I feel like it's probably a good idea because of the places I've lived. And I've also heard that same those same remarks from people that have had mold that as long as you're living in the same place, you're still getting exposed on a regular basis like that, all the products in the world aren't going to outweigh the effect of the repeat exposure. Yeah, well, the problem with it is it's so many different systems. Like it disrupts your sleep. You don't make as much melatonin. And when you don't make melatonin, then your adrenals get just dysfunctional. And then when that happens, your thyroid starts to go out. And when your thyroid goes out, you gain weight. And then when you gain weight, you tend to exercise to try and um, balance, to lose that. But exercise didn't actually have any effect for me. I lost strength in the gym. I had no endurance to even walk. Uh, my lungs were messed up and you get gut issues. And it's like a cascade and a, a, a downward spiral that the only real way to break that spiral is to move out of it. And for people who are living in it or suspect, go on a holiday somewhere that doesn't have mold and see how you feel. Um, urination, frequent urination is a very, very big red flag that I hear quite often. You know, waking up in the middle of the night two or three times to urinate that's, and kidney issues is all mold. My dad is still living in mold and he, when he's out, he's um, he doesn't pee all the time and feels better. But when he's in, he's like waking up three or four times in the night to pee and I'm like, yeah, dad, that's mold. <laughs> and you can get really good UVC filters. The UVC being UV is destructive and any mold spores that come in hit the UVC light and get destroyed by it. So that's a really good way to do it. Like air very filters? Expensive filter. Air filter, yeah. But the UVC specifically is the gold standard because we did have the HEPA filters. But I could send you a photo of our HEPA filter that had mold growing in the filter. <laughs> It was that bad. So, um, yeah, UVC filters are the way to go, and that definitely helps reduce the burden on the body. It's better than nothing, but, again, it comes back to that. And interestingly, I said it before, like, um, mold's a really great teacher because, you know, you want to – once I got out of that environment, I'm like, okay, I need to get this out of my body as quickly as possible. 
And that's when I form, uh, that's when I basically formulated liver complex to support all of the body's phase two clearance of this, of this, um, toxic byproduct and use things like all your binders or activated charcoals, charcoal, zeolite, bentonite, all those things that are pretty powerful. And when you're pulling them out, you can feel very bad, but you know, just give it time and trust the process and then you can get out of it and come back feeling better. And there's light at the end of the tunnel once you're out of mold. Yeah. I want to talk about the liver complex in a second because as I told you previously a couple of months ago, the liver is one of my favorite underappreciated organs. But for those that have allergies, whether it's seasonal or it's an intolerance to food, I know that DAO is sometimes used for people who can't handle alcohol. Would the Hista Resist product be able to help people in all these situations? Uh, for allergies, definitely. It's a very, it's as I said, it's a life jacket not a not a, a cure but if you're if there's allergies if there's p- pollens or there's air pollution that's not really something we can get to the root cause of unless you just completely up and move and get out of that environment so it, it's a fantastic way of dealing with with those issues it stops the mast cells what's called degranulation degranulation from mast cells is when they release all of their histamine into their body and the purpose of that is to actually get rid of the thing that's irritating the body that's why we get things like our watering eyes and all of our um, uh, first line immune responses, like mucus production, cough, all those lovely symptoms. Um, it's for a reason, but the reason, if the reason's pollen and you're just reacting to it, then better than taking some over the counter pharmaceutical that has a list of side effects, you can take something like DAO and all of the quercetin and PEA and luteolin and all these um, things like bromelain and skullcap. These are all things that will basically reduce the threshold at which your mast cells destabilize and release histamine. That's why they're called um, mast cell stabilizers. And then take um, the DAO as well, um, the enzyme, to clear the histamine within your GI tract, and that reduces your overall circulatory histamine burden. So, again, this is reducing... But it's not fixing the problem. You really do need to be able to release histamine. It's an important immune response, but it's just lowering that threshold, giving you more wiggle room before you actually experience symptoms. Yeah, that's always a a good thing that to remove the source before you try and mask the symptoms. Exactly, because you can fall in the trap of just being what's called green allopathic medicine. Instead of just using drugs to fix a problem, to uh, address a a symptom, you just use naturopathics or botanicals, but you never actually address the root cause of the of the problem. Yeah, when I was looking into some of the traditional solutions to allergies, I discovered that they inhibit acetylcholine oftentimes, and they can reduce levels in the brain. And you don't necessarily want that because that's the neurotransmitter associated with all kinds of important things, such as learning and memory. Would hysteresis do the same thing? Um, histamine itself, too, is a neurotransmitter, too. It's, it's what modafinil increases. And often when I've taken that, I've noticed my eyes start to, to water. But it's um, sort of a different histamine receptor it works on. But yeah, I don't think it increases drowsiness at all, um, c- comparative to other things. Um, I'm trying to think of the ingredients in it. I don't think any of them particularly are acetyl, um, impact acetylcholine. I could be wrong. And if I am, I'll let you know. (laughs) But yeah, compared to the pharmaceutical ones, like uh, I don't know the the generic brand names of them, but they do have that side effect. But I don't think these supportive nutrients that your body actually does need for these enzymes would have that effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now on to liver health. Why are you a fan of the liver? Of course, it played an important role in your journey. And can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so liver health is probably one of the most important things. Secondary to gut health, I think the two are very strongly interconnected. If you've got leaky gut and you've got lipopolysaccharide coming in, then that's directly going to have issues on your gut. If you've got all of the bacterial fragments, you're increasing the, the burden of the liver. And I think at the moment with the world we live in, the liver doesn't need any more challenges it's already working as hard as it can we need to give our livers a break um and all the supporting nutrients it needs things um to support phase one the intermediary phase and phase two these are the three main ways that in which the liver clears stuff we don't really detox by going on a juice cleanse like sure that might reduce the amount of things that the body has to deal with if all you're dealing with is a bit of bit of sugar and some polyphenols but 
Um, it's more the amino acids that are actually really supportive for the liver, especially phase two. Like in the liver, the first phase, phase one, is usually very highly upregulated at the moment because phase one is upregulated by toxin exposure. So if we look at the world we live in with all these um, fragrances, with all like mold, um, preservatives, any any pretty much pick your poison there's plenty of them um or these toxins coming in um drugs uh things like caffeine even certain things like grapefruit um they these will increase phase one and we kind of are always stuck close to 100 percent with how fast our phase one is going which unfortunately creates a backlog in the intermediary phase the intermediary phase is the conversion of the toxin to a more uh fats uh sorry more water soluble version in which the body tends likes to put on a bus so to speak put these toxins on a bus for excretion that's called conjugation and conjugation is how we get rid of them get them out of our body because if we don't get them out of our body they're going to continue to be a problem um but the issue that's happening as i said is phase one is basically stuck on 100 we get all of these intermediate metabolites and the intermediary phase is like a reaction that occurs in which the the um, toxin is converted. And during that reaction, we tend to have a lot of reactive oxygen species and inflammation that's caused within the liver. Usually things like glutathione, selenium, vitamin, and all the vitamins like vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, they all help quench this inflammation that occurs. If we are having an, a nourishing diet full of these fat-soluble vitamins and all of these antioxidants, things like PQQ as well, um, NRF2 activators like your brassicas, they really help support the elimination of that um, inflammation that occurs. Um, but we also need to support phase two because it's it's kind of like we need to balance out our phase one and two to get them out of their body. And there's six ways in which the body gets rid of toxins these are called the conjugation pathways this is getting a bit nerdy for people um if you don't study functional medicine this might not be particularly all that relevant but if you support all of these there's amino acid conjugation um there's glutathione conjugation glucuronidation acetylation and methylation methylation is one that people it's a buzzword at the moment methylation you might have mthfr defects and inability to methylate properly it's not the end of the world for the liver because you do have those five other backups. And I think they're really good inbuilt contingencies because if we relied on one pathway, our liver would be cooked pretty quickly. So um, there's, yes, if we support all six of them, which um, that's pretty much why I formulated Complete Liver Complex to provide something for every one of those um, phase two conjugation elimination pathways. And yeah, methylation is a big one. I think it takes care of most of the liver's burden and a lot of the really nasty things in our body. Um, and that's where basically B vitamins, um, trimethylglycine and SAMe all come in to support methylation. And this is one of the few products I've seen that has an ingredient called, or I guess abbreviated NACET, N-A-C-E-T. Why did you choose that one? Yeah, NACET, that's one of my favorites. Um, the reason I like that is... A lot of people have heard of NAC, especially in the last few years, being um, a very important thing for spicy cough. Um, <laughs> but NACID is a really unique form of, of N-acetylcysteine. Um, it's got an ethyl ester group on the end, which basically means it will it has a way better absorption than usual. Um, I think, I can't remember the exact statistics on it, but I believe it's like 10 times better absorption than regular NAC. So you, you can get away with a lot lower dose. But the ethyl ester group also allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier and get into your brain, being basically supporting glutathione levels within your brain, because it's not just in your in your liver or in your circulate in your body where glutathione is made. It's made in pretty much every cell in the body. So by using this form, the benefits of this product, which is designed to help the liver sort of be, go extend way beyond the liver and have effects everywhere in the body. Because if you're supporting glutathione, which is a, what, what a lot of the cofactors do, there's glutathione um, conjugation, which is one of the ways we get rid of these um, metabolites. But also the recycling of glutathione is so important and there's plenty of products out there that directly provide you glutathione. You can have it liposomally, you can have it as um, S-acetyl-L-glutathione, um, 
and you can just have it as reduced glutathione as well. But these sort of run into the issue of absorption and intracellular absorption too. So it's one thing to get it into circulation, but then getting it into the cell is a challenge that needs to be overcome as well. And I always think that it's better to provide the precursor that your body can use, like things like um, NAC. NAC is the precursor for glutathione, and that's why most people will use it. But the NACET form is like upgrading NAC, and that's why that's in there, as well as regular NAC. So, you know, you're getting the best of both worlds with that. There was another one, another ingredient in there that's also a standalone product you have. I will see if you pick up my hint from this, from my own description of it or my own experience with it. And that is on my 21st birthday, I was living in Spain a bunch of years ago and I wanted to celebrate. So I looked on Alibaba for this ingredient and bought a kilogram of it to help protect my liver and protect my brain and body against some of the ravages that were going to result the day after. Do you know what ingredient I'm talking about? Oh, a kilogram of it? How many drinks did you have? <laughs> I didn't use a kilogram of it, but I had to buy it and they didn't sell it in smaller quantities. So I had to go off of Alibaba and get a huge thing of it. And it's probably <laughs> still partly there at my host mom's house, but it was a lifesaver. And it's now becoming a quite popular ingredient in all kinds of products. Yeah, so we're obviously referring to DHM, dihydromyricetin. Um, this is put in the formulation to basically protect people from uh, ethanol, acetylaldehyde, all the byproducts and the negatives of alcohol consumption. Like I'm a biohacker, I love, I love my health, but I'm also social and drink occasionally. And I have it as a standalone product, but I also have it in the liver complex because when I was exposed to mold, um, mold, one of the issues with mold and the so byproducts of, of having mold either colonized in your system or in your body, um, and even candida too, you do end up with a level of acetaldehyde in your body, which can make which can contribute to the brain fog and making you kind of feel a bit like you're drunk without even having drunk any alcohol. And that's definitely what I experienced in the peak of my um, mold exposure. So the DHM is in there to basically help people if mold is a factor. As I said, this product was made for me when I was in mold, how I was going to get it out of my body and stop stop the issues that happened with my hormones as well. But um, yeah, the DHM is just this awesome ingredient that I think is going to probably become one of the most popular ingredients around the world when you consider how many people drink and end up with hangovers. Like it just makes sense really. And the way it works is by supporting the enzymes that convert ethanol to acetaldehyde to acetate for, for secretion. Mm -hmm. These enzymes are ADH and ALDH. And yeah, DHM um, just sub increases the activity of these enzymes, um, but it also is a direct antioxidant too and helps the liver. Yeah. And when I was researching it back in, well, I guess this was like 2015, there wasn't tons of research around it. There was a lot more, there's a lot more now than there was back then. But this is one of those ingredients that I took and I actually noticed a strange effect that's reported by some people around the internet. And that is that it actually felt like it sobered me up while I was drinking. Yeah, yeah. I um, have just got a heap of it in. So I test drove it on the uh, two weekends ago when my um, mother-in-law came and stayed and I drank three days in a row. She probably thought I was an alcoholic, but I was just experimenting, I promise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah I had way more drinks than I like have been ever able to have, like not barring like my 20s when I was stupid and ended up vomiting. But yeah, it's incredible when I took that combined with the liver complex, you know, helping with glutathione and then taking a, a big dose. The dosages on DHM are important too because there are products out there that have it in it, they don't disclose how much is in it, but the amount you need because of its poor bioavailability is high. You need minimum of 1,200 milligrams. Depending on body weight, I would go as high as 2,000 milligrams, so two grams of the stuff to actually get the effects because some formulations have it and I've seen it like a dose being 350 milligrams and I really don't think you will feel any better for having that small of a dose and you'd probably still end up with a hangover, which that's why you take it to prevent getting a hangover. So yeah, being cautious of how much you dose and certain products as well um, I've seen on the market are 350 milligrams 
and then that's 30 capsules at 350 milligrams of capsules. So to actually get it, you might only get like five or six serves out of the whole bottle. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if someone comes up with like a liposome or a phytosome or some kind of way of increasing the bioavailability of it. I believe it's called, it's like in raisin tea extract or something like that. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's interesting with these things that are low bio, bioavailability, like NAC is one of them as well. That's why NACET is great because we're increasing the bioavailability. But usually with things with low bioavailability, that's where you see dosages uh, above 1500 mg, like above a gram to two to three milligrams. I think creatine even has pretty low bioavailability. That's why we get pretty high doses with that. And I'm really excited um, about a precursor to creatine any of these precursor ingredients get me really excited because we can um, either bypass the bioavailability issues like we have with glutathione or we can just support our body with what it needs to do it itself rather than just giving it a crutch in the direct product and guanadino acetic acid gaa is the precursor to creatine that's really got me really excited and i've been experimenting with that one a lot lately and the reason I like that is basically the same reason I like NAC is because GAA can enter the brain as well and increase creatine levels in your brain. And that is an atropic effect as a hydration on your brain effect. That is pretty um, profound as well. So combining NAC with GAA and things like PEA, which is a fantastic anti-inflammatory, these are going to reduce inflammation, increase brain health, and I really think are going to be... It, a huge part of future nootropic formulations, but also creatine monohydrate is the most studied supplement in the world. Like if we can improve that or they've already improved it with GAA, I think that's going to have huge implications for sports performance industry and for pre-workouts and all that sort of stuff. So having tried it, I've definitely noticed an increase in my strength, uh, re reduction in fatigue, but also back to liver health, like creatine, a lot of your methylation um, or your methyl donors go to creating creatine. So by cre taking creatine itself, either as um, monohydrate or any of the other forms or taking um, uh, liposomal creatine, we're seeing, for example, is a really good way to spare your methyl donors so they can go into methylation for all of the other factors that's required for liver health. The nuance to GAA, I need to say, though, it being a, cre a precursor to creatine, it does use methyl groups. So if you are taking GAA by itself, you need to be taking your methylation cofactors like your B3, 6, 9, 12, uh, SAMe or trimethylglycine, or even just take creatine as well with it. And that way you won't be depleting your own methyl groups. Yeah. I find that form of creatine especially interesting because I am a non-responder to normal creatine monohydrate. I've been using it on and off for over a decade and notice pretty much no effect other than I might gain a pound or so of water weight. But I wish the data is so compelling. I wish I actually felt a noticeable increase and I still take it pretty regularly regardless. But I think this will be an interesting one to experiment with. It will be. I've um, got it coming in an upcoming product. That's why I'm so well-versed in it. So once I've got that out, I'll send it to you to try. Awesome. Yeah. And then you've mentioned a couple other things that we don't have time for today, such as PEA. There is an ingredient on your site called terkesterone, I believe it's pronounced. And there, we didn't even touch on nootropics today. So I hope at some point when you have some more formulas re ready to go, we can have another one of these and chat about some of the other fascinating ingredients and formulas people can look into. But for today, we will start to wind this down. And if people are interested in connecting with you and trying some of the Level Up level up Health products, how do they go about that? Uh, Instagram is probably the best place to connect to me. Um, I have Facebook, but pretty much refer people to just go to the Instagram on that. Um, otherwise, my website's leveluphealth.com. And uh, yeah, that's really... Uh, the only two real ways to reach out to me and I don't actually work with people because I'm so overwhelmed with formulating and running the business but there's a heap of practitioners um, mainly within Australia but it's expanding who do work with Level Up Health products and are seeing really good effects so yeah shouldn't be too long before they're easily available to the American audience apologies to anyone who orders it does take a couple of weeks for the products to get over to America unfortunately um, geography 
is un <laughs> can't really work around geography too too much but um yeah thanks for having me um and yeah we'll be happy to talk about all those other ones on a, a upcoming pon podcast as well as all the other products i've got in the works i think my backlog is about 15 so it's just a matter of prioritizing which ones i do um we spoke before the show about neuro regenerate which is going to have all these brain peptides um once that one's up and up and uh, actually exist existing as a product can't wait to send that to you to try as well that will have um, things like dihexa, P21, and a few other ingredients which should help with neurodegenerative issues as well as be a um, kind of over-the-top nootropic, I guess you could put it that way. <laughs> Beautiful. And you did agree to give Mind Body Peak Performance listeners a special discount if they choose to buy through the link that'll be in the show notes below or use the code URBAN. And that gets them... 10% off their orders. Awesome. Thank you for that. Before we sign off, I have a couple more questions for you. Mm -hmm. if, the, if there was a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge was lost and you got to save the works of three teachers, who would you choose and why? Um, this might be a real like modern answer, but honestly, Ben Greenfield's books, his uh, biohacking Bible, I forgot, I think Limitless is the book, was it? Mm -hmm. I might be wrong. Yep. That has, That is like, the encyclopedia of everything that I've learned over the last eight years. So we're saving Ben Greenfield's work. <laughs> that definitely for sure. Um, I really like Jack Cruz's work. He was pretty formative in my uh, years of education, learning beyond supplements because he doesn't really push supplements too much. So he really nail dials in the environmental aspects of health, you know, this, the importance of the sun and earthing. So his work will save, will save Dr. Jack's. And even though he doesn't have a book, I really need to save the work uh, of my mentor, Malcolm, who was the director of the hyperbaric oxygen clinic I worked at. He's been doing this for 30 years and he's had his fair share of challenges against regulatory bodies, but he's helped thousands of people. So, um, yeah, I've got to tip my hat to him and hopefully he hears this and, uh, yeah, continues doing the good work. So those are the three people. Definitely. All right, Kyle. And what is the one thing or one of the things that the Level Up Health tribe does not know about you? Well, what they don't know about me? Uh, whew, I don't know. Maybe that I'm just a, a new dad, um, that I'm obsessed with NBA basketball, uh, that my purpose behind my business is to honor my mom who passed of cancer. And everything I do is basically to help people who have been in, who are or have been in a poor state of health, like I have been, like my mum was, and to try and give people hope uh, with products that actually work rather than pissing money away or using poor quality products or underdosed or, you know, we, during her challenges, we spent tens of thousands of dollars on products and just threw everything at it. And it was really challenging to navigate the whole supplement industry especially when there's certain companies that don't do things right so uh, my philosophy behind everything i do is dedicated to her and you know helping people better themselves and hopefully get on top of whatever health issue is ailing them that is the perfect way to wrap this one up kyle thank you for joining me today on the podcast it's been a pleasure hosting you and chatting about some of your products, your formulas, and the ingredients that have your attention these days. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. We uh, overcame the poor internet quality and time zone differences. And oh, thank you for having me. And we made it, it work. Honor. All right. I'm Nick Urban here with Kyle Vanderleest signing out from mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.